Hey guys, how's it going? About two, two days later, after the last video was made from working on Bob's uh, 54 Beetle that uh, has been sitting for a long time and he's trying to get it back on the road and in the past it had a later generation motor in it and now it has the correct 36 horse that should be in it and that's what you're looking at right now over there and he's never really had it on the road since then again that was like 25 years ago so it's kind of hard to remember what you did and didn't do so we're not quite sure what was done to the motor if it was just something that was put in or if it was been gone through or not but last video we were having a problem with compression there was the compression test from it uh, number one cylinder, number two cylinder, number three, number four. The right hand side seems a little lower than the left number one cylinder, number two, number two especially. You pull the plug wire off and you don't get any response, any change in the way it runs at an idle. Uh, three and four were okay, but all those numbers are fairly low. They should up, be up around 100 or so. So, uh, one thing that can cause that, other than being uh, rings, which is, you know, probably the most likely culprit of what's going on with this, sometimes they could leak around the cylinder heads, and the studs, uh, it's an air-cooled motor, so it's not like you're going to have a leaky head and coolant's going to come out of it. It doesn't show any, any of that aspect. Only sometimes when it's cold, you rev it up, you hear like what you sound like, it sounds like an exhaust leak. And then as it warms up, it has a tendency to go away because the gap between the cylinder, and this is a picture of the cylinder head. And if you turned it sideways, the, the cylinder's going up to the side of the head. The bolt's drawing it in. Um, as the engine warms up, everything kind of expands a little bit, but the studs are pretty much staying the same. It closes up the gap between the cylinder and the head. And that exhaust leak is, is exhaust escaping from that little gap. Anyway, so we're going to look into making sure that that is just not an issue on this. And what you have the capacity of doing is the tops, these are all the, the head bolts that we're looking at. The tops are kind of hard to access. Actually, on a 36 horse motor, you could actually see them. But any of the later motors, these are hidden by engine tin. But we can get to these. So I'm just going to go see if that takes any bit of a uh, cylinder head torque. And if the head kind of draws itself further in. If all these are up to, still up to snuff as far as what their torque is, then um, again, it's just more than likely uh, bottom end issues. I mean, not, not, sorry, cylinder uh, and ring issues. And if you have a 36 horse, uh, torque into 25 pounds, and uh, everybody else gets up to 22 or 23 pounds. So we're gonna set our torque wrench at 25, and we're gonna see if any of that stuff um, happens before. So I'll set you up with the camera under the car and we'll get at it. That's see how this, well this works out. So the back cover is just kind of held down with a bale, kind of like a, uh, how to break massive cylinder covers are. Put a rag through it and give it a snap or get a screwdriver under it. Sometimes they piss oil, but they won't piss much. So I'm going to remove this um, rocker assembly. We'll get it right out of our way. Fourteens. The older ones are fourteens. They're going to be under tension. At least one of the cylinders will be under tension. I just like to throw this stuff right in the valve cover. Or drop it on the floor. Whichever comes first. Right back go. Again, being this much of an older motor, the hardware setup is a little bit different. assembly right out of our way. I believe they should be a 15. Which they are. If you're torquing a cylinder head, you would um, have a pattern that you go through. Usually you start in the middle and you work your way out. 
But again, we're just looking to see if this takes anything. Now this torque wrench is set at 25 already. So that's it. That one, it was still good. Usually if they turn, they'll turn like a good half turn. Uh, sometimes all the way up to a full turn when they're got. And that a lot of times is either the stud is pulling out of the motor or the, um, the motor got real hot and everything kind of stretched and cooled off. You know, over hot, overheated. So that's not gonna be our issue, but I wanted to uh, check that anyway. And also I'm gonna do the same to the other side and then I'm gonna get back and we'll adjust the valve. All right, so I got all the uh, rockers back on. One of the washers was missing on this side. You saw when I took it apart when they fell, like a washer fell out on one side. So all that's back together. I set the other side. The other side was fine also. Rockers are back on. Plugs are still out of it. Uh, I just want to set all the valves a little bit before I try and adjust them. So I just want to uh, spin the motor just for a second or two just to uh, make sure everything is seated. Good. And now I'm going to take it so that the rotor on the distributor, I turn the motor so the rotor points at number one spark plug wire, which is going to be this cylinder. So if I know I'm going to be sparking on this cylinder, I should be good to adjust the valves, and that's what I'm going to do. It's almost right there. I got lucky in that one. So this cylinder, the valve should rattle. You have 6,000 feel of gauge. That one's kind of loose. That one's kind of loose. So I'm going to just crack both of those right now. Sometimes the studs will fight you. Sometimes the nut will be frozen onto the stud. That one turns free. So you gotta use the screwdriver and the wrench at the same time. Like that. And again, you're just looking for drag. That's a little too tight. And also, sometimes it affects it when you tighten the nut down, the, the adjustment gets, gets knocked out of whack a little bit. So you just kind of crack it loose and you try to make up the difference that you think you need. So I'm gonna try backing it up just a hair. That's good. The other side. It should be able to at least support the weight of the, of the pack if, you, if the pack doesn't stay. And, uh, that's good. So now I'm going to continue on to do the same thing. I'm going to go over to number two cylinder, turn or move the rotor to points at number two spark plug wire, adjust this one, and do the same for the other two on the other side. So I was getting ready to recheck the compression again. I actually put the gauge in number one, but I was looking at it in the belt that's on here. It feels a little too tight. So I just want to go drop that back a little bit. There's a slot behind the uh, generator pulley. If you rotate it, it'll hit. There's a screw holding it, the assembly together. So that kind of just jams the two pieces together. You can 
back them off. And what they have is shims that they adjust the pulley with. Hopefully this one has one still left behind. Yes it does. So we're going to, um, actually what do we want to do? What are you doing? You want to add a shim because you want the two halves of the pulley to sit a little further apart and give a little bit more room for the bell. If that stays too tight it'll, it'll kill the bearings on the generator. That's why I'm going back in and adjusting it. It kind of has to rotate when you do it, when you tighten it. A lot of times you put the wrench on it it'll start spinning on its own because you want that belt to walk to the outside. Hmm. Take one more out. Uh, add one more rather. Life of a dyslexic. We say and do the things opposite you mean. And the spare shims just go on the front side. That's why those shims are out there. So, the stack that's here. Plus, you need it because if you don't have enough shims in it, this spacer will not be able to push down far enough. You'll tighten the nut up, but it's not tight. The two halves of the pulley aren't tight against each other. That's better. That's about right. It's probably pretty close to uh, to that last shim. Which way we go on it? That's the way we want to do now. We want to go do some. Uh, Compression testing. See if we can set it up where you can see the gauge. I don't know if we're going to be able to or not. Can you guys see that? Let's see if we'll zoom you right in on it. Now you can see. So I'm just going to hold it full throttle. There's no plugs in the motor except for that one cylinder uh, has the compression gauge in it. We got um just shy of 100 pounds. I'm going to I'm going to call that 95, 96 pounds. Reset, we'll do the next cylinder. All right, this is the problem cylinder. Let's see what we get. Yeah, that one's uh, 75. We'll call it 75. All right, so this is the compression test redone, and uh, the cylinder that we kind of know we have an issue with is still at 75 psi. So we got 95, 95, 100, and 75. So that one cylinder uh, has issues of some sort, and one of the things we're going to go do is go check the uh, uh, leak down test. So we're going to do a, a leak down test on this, and that pretty much just tells you um where your compression is leaking out hence the name leak down so what you do is where the spark plug is you inject uh, air directly to it with the valves closed and if you look over here the uh, distributor is off again and the rotor is pointed towards number two cylinder 
and I have vice grips holding the bottom nut to keep the crank from turning because the pistons at top dead center you put air into that cylinder it wants to flip to the bottom so it's going to want to move so let's go plug that in it's going to come out uh, a couple of different places and come out the intake come out the exhaust and uh, around the cylinder head where I kind of suspected it having an issue and also if the rings are bad it will leak around the um, uh, come out the oil uh, fill uh, into the crankcase because it's leaking past the rings into the crankcase so we're gonna go plug in hopefully one-handed here and we're gonna go see so, that intake valve is uh, got an issue yeah. So that's one problem. And I don't feel anything coming in between the cylinder and the head. I could feel get air blowing out. This is the breather from the crankcase. So it's coming out past the rings and the intake valve. And again, valves, sometimes you can get sealed completely, but generally the rings are gonna have some kind of blow by. It's not gonna be perfect because there is gaps in the rings. It's just that under speed, when the motor's spinning, it's so fast that that little bit of leak you get around where the ring gap is. As I fill the place up with gas fumes, that's the carburetor working backwards. So, uh, I would say pretty much, again, yeah, it's going to be uh, intake valve and the other ones seem to be a little bit higher, but again, it may, until you tear it apart and physically look at the, the components, it's, you know, you, you're trying to troubleshoot, but, uh, you know, you take it apart and you, you find out what actually is wrong and then you, you know, repair as needed from there. So, uh, I'm going to put it back together, run it, let it warm up, and we'll see uh, how we can make... Uh, some improvements. Kind of hear it sucking back on that intake. Timing set. I had 12 volts off of a separate source instead of the car being 6 volts. But it, it fights back. It just doesn't like the fact you can. I don't know if the camera picked it up, but I was trying to show you that like, you could hear a sputter on the uh, intake side of it which is every time the compression is coming up it's like pushing back on the intake a little bit so it's as close as it's gonna get with the issues it has in it you so. can button that up uh, he is ordering a new um, gas tank for it. I don't know if I said it earlier. And we're going to get a new uh, pet for the bottom of it. And I believe the tank he's going to be able to get will have a sending unit in it so he can hook a regular gas gauge up instead of having to worry about that reserve setup. Which uh, with today's fuels, those valves don't hold up very well. Both lights are off, that's good.
So that's the only one that doesn't get affected. Hey guys, just a little side note on the uh, the newly acquired VW convertible. And uh, one of the things with that was we're trying to figure out if it was a 70 or a 71. And I was told it was 70, the owner's manual was a 70, and on the door it said 8 of 70, which normally would make it a 71. But I started running the numbers on the car, and um, the very last uh, VW in 1970 that rolled off the, the line had a number of 309-6945. This number on this one is 309-5645. Two, three, I believe it is what it was, which makes it about 500 from the end of the run. That's all VWs together, but I do not know if, uh, I wanna try to figure out what the last year, the last serial number of the last convertible was. They did not make, from 71 up, they did not make a uh, convertible. So a couple of guys confirmed that already too on the uh, last video that we put up on this car. So uh, this is a 70, very late 70, but uh, if we find out that this is the uh, last convertible ever made that was a standard, that would be awesome. But, uh, who knows? Anybody knows a way to go and uh, acquire that information or has access to that information, please uh, write down below a little, uh, jot down a little, a little uh, note down below and see what we can figure out, figure it out together. Thanks guys.